Welcome back, I'm That Chemist, and today we have another extreme compilation involving the symbiote incident. This story happened during my senior year of high school, during my AP chemistry class, and it is now fondly remembered as the symbiote incident. This class was quite a small class, consisting of seven people at first, and later on dropping to just the five of us. I saw the small class size as a good thing, and the class itself would be a fairly tightly knit group as a result. There was one group of three, and I was in the group of two with my lab partner, I'll call HJ. I don't remember the specific reaction we were conducting in this lab with 100% certainty, but what I do remember is we were precipitating copper from a solution, and we were using acid to do so, probably nitric. We were adding probably the nitric acid dropwise to a beaker of what became a black, bubbling, inky, and opaque solution, which we were consistently stirring and heating on a hot plate. My guess is that this reaction was just an endothermic one, and the hot plate was to provide the necessary energy to complete the reaction, but it was a long time ago and I'm uncertain. It was crucial that we kept stirring the beaker, or else the bubbles would cause the mixture to boil over and create a giant mess. Our teacher stressed this as something of utmost importance. We were very careful about it. HJ was doing an excellent job keeping the solution boiling over, and everything was going as planned. When we deemed that all of the copper in the solution had precipitated, HJ briefly stopped stirring so he could quickly transfer the beaker from the hot plate to the lab table. It genuinely took one second of inactivity before it happened. The beaker violently boiled over in a massive spray, splattering inky black, boiling, potentially acidic mixture all over the table, hot plate floor, our technology, and our clothes. Pictures included. Maybe even the ceiling. I forget. HJ got the worst of it, and his shirt and pants were both destroyed. I got a few small black spots on my jeans, since I wasn't as close when it happened. Aside from the tiny droplets on our hands, it didn't get on our skin. Good thing we wore our goggles. We were flabbergasted at how quickly it all happened, and we just stood there for a few seconds before the others in the room came over to see what the hell just happened. HJ was shocked, but if I remember correctly, he quickly started laughing about it, since it was fairly comical and absurd looking. I joked about how the black slop looked like venom, and we ended up consistently referring to it as the symbiote. You'll have to forgive our lack of urgency in this situation. In retrospect, I doubt that the solution was that acidic at all, since, in theory, all the acid should have already reacted with the copper in solution when we were reducing it. It would have only been acidic if we had excess nitric acid left over with nothing else to react with. If this was acidic, it probably wouldn't have been very strong, unless we seriously overshot the mark. Still, we were all pretty confused. The other group had carried out the same exact procedure without any catastrophe, or any issues at all for that matter. We couldn't figure out what had gone so catastrophically wrong. That was when our teacher suddenly realized exactly what happened. Now, the teacher of this class was definitely one of the best teachers I've ever had across the board. Very charismatic, kind, and soft-spoken. But he was a little bit forgetful at times. Apparently, the teacher decided to give the first group a magnetic stir rod to help the solution sufficiently agitate it while they manually stirred. For the non-chemists, a magnetic stir rod is a tiny magnet that spins on the bottom of a beaker or other vessel to stir solutions. This made it safe for them to briefly pause stirring and relocate the beaker. However, our teacher had forgotten to give our group one as well, so we'd been handling a live grenade. He was very embarrassed. The lab was ruined, but we weren't that crushed about it or annoyed. We weren't even annoyed about our clothes. It was more shocking and amusing than anything else. We cleaned up the mess, but we were never able to remove the black stains from our clothes. I think of my stained pair of pants as more of a souvenir, and I fondly refer to them as my chemistry pants. I'd argue that they've been improved by the whole incident, because now I have this story to share. This isn't related to an overflow, but I have a similar story. My friend Mitchell was working as a lab tech one summer, and he was cleaning up a bunch of the old solutions that the undergrads had generated during the semesters. One of these solutions was nickel dimethyl glyoxime, which is a derivative of 2,3-butanedione, which is the chemical that gives people popcorn lung. However, it's a bis-oxime, and this bis-oxime is able to form a complex with a number of metals, including nickel. Well, it just so happened that Mitchell accidentally got this turquoise green solution on his lab coat, and it turned pink. So he decided to dip even more of his lab coat into the solution to turn it pink, and it stayed pink permanently afterwards. And I was like, that's pretty dumb. You don't know what that's going to do. Plus, nickel salts aren't that great. And he's like, oh, I didn't even think about that. I just thought it was funny that it turned pink. I'm not a chemist by any means, but I have a story about bleaching mold in a real estate property. We had torn out the walls and floor joints in a living room and found black mold growing throughout the entire house, and my employer had consulted a mold expert to remedy it. 
The guy had told them that either ammonium perchlorate would work, and if he wanted something stronger, recommended 70% hydrogen peroxide. My employer purchased some 5-gallon jugs of both and used hydrogen peroxide in a sprayer on another house and didn't clean it. So when he asked me to spray the entire house down after everyone had left for the weekend, I figured, sure, why not? I was provided all the necessary PPE, but was asked if I wanted a Tyvek suit, and I assumed either of those would just bleach my skin a little bit if it got on me. So I fit a respirator, eye protection, gloves, and get to pouring. Oh no, this is not great. These are both really strong reagents that you definitely don't want to be spraying everywhere without proper PPE. I start spraying. Maybe 15 minutes goes by, and the sprayer runs out. Or so I thought. So I go to open the sprayer, and the perchlorate had mixed with the hydrogen peroxide. Became pressurized, and erupted as a loud, thick foam. Foop! That just kept coming and coming. Foop, 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 foop! I had gotten it on my forearms and ran outside to wash my arms off and took all of my PPE off. Forgetting that I had left the sprayer in there, as well as a few other tools, I made the mistake of thinking I could just run inside the chloramine-filled house and be fine if I just held my breath. That was a mistake, as by the time I had gotten everything out, I had snot running down my shirt and my eyes were nice and pink. The peroxide had bleached all the hairs on my forearms white. LOL. So a few dumb mistakes made by all of us led to an even dumber outcome for me. I didn't even realize the fire hazard of using oxidizers that strong until much later. Yeah, honestly, if it's that bad, I don't even know if it's worth trying to recover the house at that point. Like, black mold's pretty bad. This picture here, if it was that moldy, I would just leave and run. This is today's Yikes Awardee. Disclaimer, I do not recommend or condone the following behavior. Lab safety should be paramount. That being said, I had a strange impulse to sniff things, even if I know what something smells like already, or know it's not good to smell. In chemistry, this is not exactly great, considering I've worked with a lot of toxic, carcinogenic, or otherwise dangerous chemicals that I can't resist borderline huffing. And I'm not talking about wafting, I'm talking about container to my nose and taking a deep breath. Things I've sniffed include, but are not limited to, benzenes, substituted and non-substituted, ethers, including diethyl ether, DCM, HCl, liquid and gaseous, H2PO4, H2SO4, Cl2, formaldehyde, chloroform, glacial acetic acid, vinyl chloride, acetic anhydride, azo dyes, beta mercaptoethanol, random salts and other organic solids used in the chem lab, etc. During one of the chemistry club meetings, our teacher decided we were going to dispose of some old reagents on the drain. Some were supposed to be disposed of at the local waste facility. We were tasked with identifying which was supposed to go where, since some containers had very faded labels. It was getting late, and the teacher left us unsupervised, so two lazy guys took one of the unmarked bottles to dump it into the toilet. We heard a loud thump and ran to check what had happened. The bottle contained some sodium lumps under petroleum. Why does this sodium story keep happening? Why do so many people put sodium into the toilet? What the heck? Most of the bathroom was on fire, and both of those idiots ended up with burns and cuts from the toilet bowl debris. They recovered, but from what I'd seen, they were extremely unlucky. One piece of toilet bowl went through the stall wall and lodged itself into the next toilet stall wall. <sighs> this is what you get when you flush sodium down the toilet. You flush your arms down the toilet as well. This is something that happened the other day. I recently went on a trip for a week. To ensure no one entering my room, I closed my window and the door to my room. I forgot to turn my table lamp off, and it turns out being on for five days straight wasn't too good for the lamp, and it damaged the lamp. The damaged lamp turns out to be ionizing the air. Essentially, it had become an ozone generator in a sealed room. When I returned from my short trip, I entered my room and felt the pungent ozone smell. Not immediately putting two and two together, I sat down at the table next to my lamp, doing some work for about two hours or so. My throat started feeling dry and sore a bit later, and I felt shortness of breath, and my lungs felt pretty bad. By this time, one of my relatives enters the room and immediately went, Man, it sure smells like ozone in here. That is when I realized what was going on, and I turned the lamp off. After about half an hour of ventilating, the ozone smell was gone, and I replaced the damaged light bulb. My throat still feels pretty bad, but other than that, it seems no more damage was done. Once, as a kid, I was stirring some reaction mixture, primarily composed of white fuming nitric acid. My stir rods were dirty, so I was using a test tube as a fatty stir rod. Sloshing the fat stir rod against the sides of the beaker caused some of the nitric acid to miraculously splash out vertically, sending a drop of fuming nitric acid directly into my right eye! Holy crap! 
I rushed to the bathroom and poured baking soda into my hand and then, and then water and just splashed the solution into my eye, repeating several times and then switching to just water. My vision was blurry out of that eye for three or four days, no lasting effects. Dear God, son, that is the most horrifying thing I have ever heard of. Getting fuming nitric acid in your eye would be the type of thing that would close my eyes to chemistry probably permanently. Dear God, you're lucky that there's no lasting effects. I feel like there's lasting effects just from hearing that story. Here's a fun little story from high school. It was during sophomore year in Chem 1, and we were doing a fun little chem lab where we just demonstrated conservation of mass by burning steel wool. My teacher first demonstrated by burning two pieces of steel wool in a fume hood, both on scales for reference, one in a closed Erlenmeyer and one in an open one. We saw that the mass of the open Erlenmeyer sample decreased, and the closed one stayed the same. Pretty cool, we thought. We had to do the same thing as an assignment. What I and my lab partner had to do was basically weigh out the piece of steel wool and the Erlenmeyer flask. Then we had to put the steel wool inside and use a spark maker to ignite it before quickly covering the Erlenmeyer flask with a rubber stopper. All was going well, and I even held it up to see the burning wool up close. Oh no, we know how this is going to go. Then for some reason, my butterfingers dropped it. The next thing I know, a burning substance contained only by glass was falling to the ground. I don't know why but in the heat of the moment, I tried to catch it. Too late, the flask already exploded as it hit the floor and the leg of the table, and my hand got a nice baptism of glass and burning steel wool. It would have stopped there with some cuts and burns on my hand, but this was only the beginning. Oh no. For some reason, the lab tables are all made of wood with some non-flammable tops, so naturally it ignited and made everything ten times worse. A fire blanket and fire alarm later, and now future chem students get to have a worksheet on conservation of mass instead of a lab. Dear God, these, you guys had some really bad mishaps here. I'm kind of convinced that the high school chemistry teachers at this point are probably as bad as an undergrad in chemistry, because if your chemistry teacher has an undergrad in chemistry, that's probably as educated as they ever got. In high school, we did a chemistry project to synthesize soap with sodium hydroxide and oil. We did it in a volumetric flask with a stopper. But this reaction forms gas, and one of my friends wasn't holding the stopper firmly enough. So the stopper went out, thump, under the pressure, and my friend got some sodium hydroxide in his eyes. Oh no, seriously guys, what's with you getting chemicals in your eyes? Luckily, the sodium hydroxide wasn't very concentrated, and my friend was wearing protective glasses, so there was no injury. We also got to see for the first time what the weird tap next to the teacher's desk was for. But my teacher got scared and didn't do the test with the groups the next day. Four years ago, I followed one year of applied science, which had a lot of chemistry. I was just starting out and honestly didn't take the lab too seriously. We were in the lab almost four times a week and I was always tired. My lab partner was also a mess. I liked chemistry, but I wasn't made out for something as strict as a lab. I often forgot steps or tried to take shortcuts. You know what? All chemists do, so that doesn't mean anything. One day, we were working with diethyl ether for an extraction, and because we'd used a separatory funnel, we had a beaker filled with the leftover diethyl ether. I made sure to use a separate beaker so I would remember. While my partner finished the last steps, we started working on some stuff, and I remembered smelling a kind of ethanol-like smell. I thought nothing of it, since we used ethanol to wash the glassware at the time. Apparently, for some reason, my lab partner had decided previously my beaker looked way nicer to contain water instead of something like diethyl ether, so he poured the water out of the beaker into another one, and took the beaker with water back to our workstation. I was confused and slightly tired, and sleepily doing the calculations, so I started questioning the liquid. For some reason, my stupid brain decided to take a whiff of the water in front of us to check if it was water. It definitely was not water. It almost immediately felt like I downed four beers, and I got really wobbly. I switched them around, and the next 20 minutes or so, me and my lab partner had a really hard time doing the calculations. You know, ether psychoactive, and it was one of the first anesthetics, and it seems like you and your lab partner got a little bit anesthetized. Also, that guy in the back corner kind of looks like he only has one eye on his head. That's pretty creepy. Not as creepy as this transition to our patrons. I want to take a quick mention to thank all of the patrons for their support of the channel. We really appreciate your continued support, and it helps make these videos a little bit more easily. Thanks for watching, and I hope you have a great day. Boom, 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 boom.